Uh, welcome to church today. So good to see you. And isn't it great winter in Queensland? It was awesome. It was a great two weeks of it. It was fantastic. And uh, it's just been wonderful and ready to hit the beach again. Praise God. If you've got your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And um, actually, I just felt Nigel and Kerry Stratton. And uh, hello, where's Nigel gone? He's ducked out, gone to the bathroom. And um, I just, oh, I was oh, filming. Okay, okay awesome. Um, I just um, uh, I just felt the Holy Spirit say he's got bundles of blessings awaiting you uh, that you're going to walk into. And he's just going to drop. Uh, it was like when Ruth was in Boaz's field and uh, he would drop extra bundles for her. And, uh, and I just felt God say that you're just going to walk along and you're going to have some unexpected extra bundles of blessing that God's going to drop into your world that you're just going to walk into. Amen? Praise God. Um, Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verse 15. Oh, no, there was someone else I had to... Who was it? There was someone else here. I felt... Hmm, where are ah, yeah. It was uh, Ben Jakes. Uh, how are you, mate? And... Um, I just felt God say he's going to open up another stream of provision for you uh, that you can't see yet. It looks like there's the one that's been coming is kind of drying up a bit, but I just felt God say he's got another one coming for you uh, that you're going to be able to add to, and it's going to be an even greater blessing. God's not going to leave you in the lurch. He's a good father. Uh, he's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who sees and provides. He sees your need, and he's well able to provide for it, and it's going to be supernatural. It's going to increase your faith, and it's going to be a testimony to others. Amen? Praise God. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, says this. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I just ask and pray that you would give us, open the eyes of our understanding to see what you have for us. I thank you and praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, For those of you uh, that would know, a couple of weeks ago, started a new series uh, on the book of Ephesians. So this term, uh, in the morning, we're going to be preaching uh, on the letter of Ephesians. And it was written by the Apostle Paul, and there are many components of Ephesians that are very similar uh, to the kind of letters that the Romans would write when they're communicating to their people that they're going to invade another place or they're going to go to war. And so there's a lot of typology of that. That's why it says at the end of Ephesians in Ephesians 6, 10 and 11, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armour of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So knowing this, we can see that everything in Ephesians is necessary for us to be advancing Christians and an advancing church. God hasn't called us to just sit back and wait for him to return. He's called us to advance, to move forward, to take territory for King for him. It's his desire that his kingdom advances. And everything that Ephesians talks about is necessary for us to be those advancing Christians and also to be that advancing church. On the first First week, we talked about our identity in Christ, about what the Scripture tells us that we are. So what that tells me is we can't be all that God has called us to be until He knows, until we know who He, ha- who we are in Christ. Last week we talked about what we have. So we talk about the things that we have access to as a result of being a believer. At the end of it, He talks about in verse fourteen of Ephesians chapter one, He talks about how we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit has come upon us and has enabled us to live the powerful life that he has called us to live. Today, the Apostle Paul turns it uh, in verses 1, 15 uh, to 23. He actually says a prayer and he is praying that the eyes of their understanding will be opened, that they will be enlightened and received a revelation. So here he is saying to them that he prays that they receive the, a revelation about three different things. And so today I want to talk to, to you about what we actually need. 
about what the Apostle Paul says we need if we uh, revelate a revelation of if we are going to be the advancing Christians and the advancing church that God has called us to be. And so I want to talk to you today about three things that you need or what you need, three things that we need to have a revelation of if we're going to be the advancing Christians and the advancing church that he's called us to be. The first thing uh, that he talks about is in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. And the first part of it, he says that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, that you may know that uh, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The first thing we need to get a revelation of is the hope of hope of his calling, or we need to have a revelation of hope. When it says the hope of his calling, he's actually kind of brandishing altogether those who are Christians, those who believers, saying that we are called to it. So the emphasis there is really on hope. And what that means is this, that we need to, ha- need to have a revelation of the hope that we can have in Christ. As Christians, we should be the most hope-filled people in the world because our hope is not dependent upon circumstances, but our hope is upon the, uh, the revelation that we have a relationship uh, with God. Um, the, three, the Bible says that, there are th- that three things remain, faith, hope, and and love. And so they're three distinct characteristics. For many years, I actually didn't know the difference really between faith and hope. I kind of bundled it together. Uh, A number of years ago, um, I was praying and God really spoke to me and he said, Ben, you've got to, you've got to, um, you know, you're good with faith, but you're bad with hope. And at that time, I got a revelation and looking at scripture, it's true uh, that I saw the difference between faith and hope. Faith is essentially an action. So it's founded on God's promises. So when God tells us to do something, we have to step out and do it. That's why the Bible says in James that faith without works is dead. So faith requires works. So faith is actually uh, expressed through action. That's why the heroes of the faith were commended. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that the heroes of the faith were people who by faith Abraham did this. By faith they did that. So faith is an action. But hope is different. Hope isn't an action. Hope is an attitude. Hope is an attitude. It's like a positive, uplifting attitude that we have at all times. So as Christians, we need to be the most hope-filled people in the world. And God spoke to me and he said, Ben, you're good with faith, but you're bad with hope. And I realized he was right. I was good with faith. If he told me to do something, I would step out and do it. But it. But in between time, I could be a bit of a negative Nelly. And that's not how it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be negative as Christians. We're actually supposed to be full of hope. And he said to me, you're bad with faith, but you're good. I'm mean, sorry, you're good with faith, but you're bad with hope. And then I prayed the dumbest prayer I think I've ever prayed. And I prayed, Lord, give me hope. It was only later, reading Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 4, where it says, we glory in tribulation because tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. So the way that hope is produced in our life is by going through tribulation. And I prayed prayed a silly prayer, Lord, give me hope. And I embarked on a season of just untold, continuous disappointments and tribulations. And it was crazy. And it culminated in the Brisbane floods of 2011. So for about four years, it felt like everything I thought was going to happen didn't happen. It felt like everything I thought, you know, like all these things I'd set my heart on and hoped for wasn't happening. And I just had disappointment after disappointment, culminating in the Brisbane floods of 2011. In the middle of that time, during in the, you know, about six months after the Brisbane floods, I just remember one time being a bit still and I thought, what's that feeling? There's something bubbling up on the inside of me. I'm feeling quite good. I'm feeling quite positive. We've just been through the Brisbane floods, but I'm actually feeling not bad. And I realised, I think it's hope. (laughs) This hope started welling up on the inside of me, and I realised I've got hope in spite of my circumstances. As Christians, we should be the most faith-filled people, most hope-filled people on the planet, in spite of what we're going through. He's writing to the Ephesians. The Ephesians were going through persecution. It wasn't easy. In fact, there was a riot about the Christians in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 that the Apostle Paul was too scared to show up to. And he's saying to these people, you can have hope in spite of what you're going through. He wants us to have a revelation of his hope. There's some people here, you're good, you're obedient, you obey, obey God, but in the, midst of the, in the middle of it, you're a pessimist. Amen. 
And that's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to get a revelation of the hope in his calling. Amen? We are supposed to be the most hope-filled people in the world. And the Apostle Paul says, I pray that you get a revelation of hope. The next thing that he says is this. And it's found in the second part of Ephesians chapter 1. And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? His inheritance in the saints. Talk about inheritance the last two weeks. It's funny when you focus on the book of the Bible, there's some common topics that come up. And in Ephesians here, he talks about inheritance a lot. Last week, he talked about the fact that we have an inheritance. That as Christians, because of our relationship with God, he has an an inheritance for us. But that's not what he's talking about here. He flips it. So he's not talking about the fact that we have an inheritance. He's talking about the fact that we are an inheritance. That actually we are God's inheritance. That's how he views us. So he wants us to get a revelation of how we are his inheritance. What that means is this. We need to get a revelation of how valuable we are. That he actually values us. The Bible says in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, he rejoices over us with singing. We sing about him. He actually sings about us. That's how he feels about us. He's writing to the Ephesians, and at the time, there was actually a little bit of a, there were often some disputes with Jewish Christians amongst that group. And somehow the Jewish Christians have a certain air of superiority towards these common Gentiles. And he's saying to them, no, 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 you are just as much a part of the family of God as these guys. You are actually his inheritance. That's how much he values us. Um, I'm not the greatest gift big giver in the world in terms of I don't always get people the best kind of gifts. So I learned my lesson a number of years ago um, when Trisha and I first started going out for her birthday I tried to impress her um, and, I, and my idea of buying someone a gift is kind of like getting them a show bag and uh, just getting a whole bunch of things and putting it uh, in the bag and, and, and I spent, I was at Bible college, I spent 200 bucks on these gifts. I was running the Christian bookstore on site. And so I was, you know, I got a, you know, I got a CD, I put it in there. I got a book, I put it in there. I got some little, you know, uh, what would Jesus do bracelets, whacked it in there. And um, that sort of thing. And I spent about a hundred, you know, a hundred bucks really on what's the equivalent of stocking fillers. And then I thought I'd better get the real centerpiece present. So I went over to Maya and he had a poor Bible college student, bought her some Coco Chanel perfume. All right, seriously. And I thought, she's going to love this. And so I went and I gave her, on her birthday, I brought out the gift and brought the bag and gave it to her. And she picks up the CD and goes, oh, yeah, puts it down. Uh, Picks up the bag of the book, oh, yeah, puts it down. Uh, She picks up uh, the Robert Jesus bracelet, puts it down. And then she picks picks up the Coco Chanel perfume. She's like, oh. You know what I thought? I thought I wasted 100 bucks. I bought all these other things, and, I, and, then, I, and then I did another big mistake. Uh, went back to Melbourne. I was in Sydney at Bible College. and went back to Melbourne for Christmas, and we're doing a family Christmas with my, our extended family. My cousins were coming, and so we would do a Kris Kringle, and so you'd, you'd be told someone's name who you had to buy a present for. And I got, had to buy a present for my cousin, John. Hadn't seen him in about 12 months, so... Before that, I used to work, before going to Bible college, I used to work at Converse Footwear, and I used to get all the, you know, good footwear and clothing at a really cheap price, and so I'd get that for people for Christmas, and uh, they were used to that kind of standard of present. However, uh, I'd just flown into Melbourne from Sydney, it was in the afternoon on Christmas Eve, I'm rushing to try and find a shop, I just went into this shop, and it was kind of like, you know, a hardware kind of place, and, and that sort of thing, and I'm trying to find a present, and, um, and you know, shop's going to close soon, and I thought I'd just grab, and I just saw, and I don't know why I thought this, I just saw a random, uh, poor, you know, like travel hairdryer, and just a little one. And so I thought, I'm going to buy this for my cousin John. And I thought, I'm sure he can use it. And so I just grab it, you know, hastily, paid for it. Christmas Day, next day, word had got out who was buying presents for each other. And my cousin heard that I was buying a present for him. And they were used to be my, me buying good presents. And the problem was when I turned up, I found out that my cousin John had shaved off all his hair. <laughs> and so... So I'm feeling a bit awkward. I thought, oh, he'll grow his hair back or something. And, and he's looking up. He goes, I heard you got my present. He goes, that's great. 
He goes, what you get me from Converse? I said, I don't work at Converse anymore. He goes, yeah. He goes, you know, I know you got a good present for me. Which one is it? He started looking at the tree. I said, ah, uh, yeah, it's that box thing there. Oh, it's a box. All right, what is it? Is it shoes? You know, and I'm saying, no. And, um, and so we're sitting around and then we hand the presents out and he grabs a present before opening. He looks at me, he's like, and I'm sitting there thinking. <laughs> and he opens up the box and it's the hairdryer. And he looks at it, he's like, good one, <laughs> you got me. Okay, now where's the real present? <laughs> and I said, that is the real present. He goes, no, nah, no, nah, come on, no, nah, seriously, stop mucking around. Where's, where's the real present? I said, that is the real present. He goes, what? Is that it? What's happened to you? He goes, you used to buy the best presents. He said, now it's terrible. And I just learnt my lesson. So the next, actually, I felt bad the next day I went to Meyer at the Boxing Day sales and bought him something else and, and that sort of thing. And, and I just, you know, it's one thing buying a present for someone else, but when you buy a present for yourself, you always get it right. And so that's why I like giving vouchers because I know I'll give you this voucher and you'll get a present for yourself because when you buy something for yourself, that's what you really want. Why am I saying that? Don't know. Oh, yeah. We a God's present he bought for himself. We are his inheritance. We're not the leftover hairdryer. That's how he looks at us. We are valuable. Some people here have been branded by rejection, branded by, you know, unforgiveness, whatever it is. But we need to understand we are his inheritance. He loves us. He paid a price for us, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He values us. He loves us. And he wants us. That's good preaching. Amen. We are his inheritance. And he is saying, I pray you get a revelation of how he thinks about you. Because if we don't get a revelation of how he thinks about us, we can never be the territory takers he's called us to be. Amen? Too right, mate. Next one is this. He says in verse 19 of Ephesians chapter 1, the other thing he wants us to get a revelation of, and that is, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? The third thing he wants us to get a revelation of is his power. To be honest, this is the whole point of chapter 1. It's the main reason why he's writing this. He kind of just says, you know, getting the hope of his calling and the fact that you're his inheritance, but the main thing he wants us to get a revelation of this. He wants us to get a revelation of his power. That's the main thing. That's why at the end of last week in verse 14, he says that, remember, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that we actually have access to his power. We need, a, we need a revelation of his power. A revelation that his power is toward us. He's writing this to the Ephesians. And in Ephesus, as I said to you before, there's a temple, uh, the temple of Artemis or Diana. It's actually one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a major religion at the time. It was actually the centre the center of finance for the world at that time as well. And every year that they would have a festival called the Artemisian Festival, and people would make pilgrimage to go to Ephesus to worship at this. And one of the main reasons why they would go, the draw cards for going, is that they were promised if they came, they could access Artemis's power. And so what they would do is they would make pilgrimage from all around the world, very expensive. When they would get there, they'd spend a lot of money. One of the things they would do is that they would often buy a little shrine of Artemis. We see in Acts chapter 19 that actually because there were so many people getting saved, sales of the shrines were going down and so a man named Demetrius actually started the riot in Ephesus because he was losing money. And so they had to go there to that place in order and then they would, what they would do is that they would go into the temple. And when they went into the temple, they would see that there's Artemis, the, the idol there, and she's got this skirt. And on her skirt is four words and they were a mystery and so what you had to do was you actually had to recite those words to access her power if you didn't recite them or pronounce them correctly you couldn't get the power so they actually had temple priests who were there who would coach you in knowing how to get this power from Artemis and the apostle Paul is saying to people who grew up in that religion 
The power of God is toward us. We don't have to go towards it. We don't have to travel and do all this stuff to get the power. In Christ, we've already got it. Amen? We're carriers of the presence of God. It's on us. We don't have to go and get it. That's why one of the things I find with some Christians, they don't have faith for here. Got faith for somewhere else. When I was in Mackay, it was amazing. In Mackay, when I first went there, there was such an inferiority complex in the culture there which had permeated the church. And what would happen is people had faith for events that happened elsewhere but not in Mackay. I remember one particular time there was a group from Mackay that travelled to Brisbane to hear a particular speaker, spent all this money. I brought that speaker to Mackay. We had him in their church and they didn't show up. Because I had faith that God would move over here, but not necessarily here. My favourite missionaries are the ones who believe that God can move everywhere, not just over there. Amen. So wherever we go, we are carriers of the presence of God. When you meet somebody who needs prayer for healing, you don't need to bring them here. You can bring them here, you should, but you can actually pray for them right there because the presence and the power of God is on us. My heart and desire for our church is that we would be people that wherever we go, we understand we're carriers of the presence of God that his power is upon us, that we don't need to get someone else to come and pray for them, but we can actually go and do it ourselves. Remember one time, amen, I remember one time I was going down, uh, going down the oval, kicking the soccer ball with the boys, I was quite young, and then I saw that there's this other kid there who was playing, and, uh, playing on the oval, and a young, young adult, and he ran up to me and he said, Pastor Ben, he recognised me, he'd seen me somewhere, and he said, Pastor Ben, could you pray for me? I said, what for? He goes, I'm struggling to sleep. I didn't say to him, oh, no, look, we need to be in church. That's where the anointing is. If we go to church, then I can pray for you. And I was like, no, no, no. I said, okay, I'll, I'll just pray for you now. Prayed for him there. Didn't think anything of it. Got a message from him next, uh, the next week. He said, I've been sleeping like a baby ever since. Amen. Wherever we go, his power is upon us. Not only that, his power is sufficient for any need. That his power is sufficient for any need, for any ailment. There's nothing that he can't do. It's sufficient for everything. It's interesting when it says here that in Ephesians chapter 1, 19 to 21, he says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us believe, uh, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. That's talking about principalities and powers and there's a lot of teaching about how in the atmosphere there's principalities and powers over regions and there are some Old Testament evidence for that so I'm, I'm certainly not against that. I do believe that can happen. But there's something even deeper regarding the Ephesians because what would happen is when they would go to the temple they would have to go in and they had to pronounce these words on her skirt and they had to pronounce them correctly, and they're a mystery. In fact, in some ways, the exact pronunciation is still a mystery. And I just found out recently that there's a professor at UQ and there's a professor in Dunedin in New Zealand who's spending their time trying to figure out what those words were because it's somewhat still a bit of a mystery. However, the gist of the words, the basic meaning of the words, there is agreement on. And the words that were at the base of her skirt were principality, power, might, and dominion. And he says to the Ephesians, our power is far above all principalities, powers, might, and dominion. You know what that means? It doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter what's going on. We serve a God who's more powerful than that. Any obstacle... Any sickness, any disease, any breakthrough that is required. We serve a God who is more powerful than anything we face. And I just felt God say that there are some people here, you're facing an obstacle that seems so big. I'm here to tell you the hills melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. We serve a God who is so much bigger. 
And maybe you're here and you're in a situation that looks so insurmountable. I'm here to let you know that your God is over and above all of that. Not only that, he says, far above all name that can be named, names that can be named. As I said to you before, that here with the Ephesians, what they said was very important. If you got the formula wrong, you wouldn't get the power. And they thought if you got the formula right, then you can get the power. And they put all their, all their faith in mere words. It's interesting in Acts chapter 19 and 20, there's a story about a man who was demon-possessed. And seven sons of Sceva, it was in Ephesus, seven sons of Sceva came to him to cast the demon out. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who Paul preaches, got to get the names right, come out. And the devil looked at him and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. I have no idea who you are. And he went and he just beat them up. Their faith was in the words. But our power is not just in the pronunciation of the words. Our power is in relationship with the living God. Amen? And the fact that you have a relationship with a living God means that you are a carrier of his power wherever you go. You are a carrier of the power and the presence of God. Any sickness, any disease, any situation, we have access to that power to believe for breakthrough. Amen? And some of you are here like, man, I'm really struggling to believe for this. I'm struggling to get the revelation. Well, the awesome thing is this. We can pray for it. Because the Apostle Paul, he says, I pray that you get the revelation, that you would be enlightened and you will be able to see the power, the greatness of the power that you have access to. Amen? And so today what I want to do is this. We want to pray for people who are saying, Ben, I just... I can't see it. I haven't got the revelation. We're allowed to pray and believe for you to get the revelation. Some of you have faith in other people. Oh, God could use them that way and God could use them that way. But no, 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 the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the same power that other people use and move in is available to us as well. Amen? And so maybe here's today and you're saying, Ben, I'm struggling to see that. I also felt God say that there's some people here and you're struggling to see God move in your situation. You've seen him move in other situations and in other people's situations, but you're struggling to see him move in your situation. Well, once again, we can pray and believe for you to get the revelation and the faith for God to move in your situation where you're at right now. Amen? So can I just ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment?